us to today's edition of our ongoing study. We're just a little bit late, you know, and so we're sorry for being late uh, for the broadcast. And I want to say this to you: the Lord is faithful; He will always, always give us food. The meal for tonight, I believe, the Lord has prepared it especially for us, so that we can. Uh, uh, have increase in our understanding of some of the essential things in spiritual warfare. We've been discussing asymmetrical spiritual warfare, and in the last lesson, lesson uh, 24, we discussed the exclusion clauses. Let me remind you again, the exclusion clauses are things that the Lord doesn't want us to go to war with. If they are valuable, if they are evident, then stop. Don't go to war. Deal with them. Check them out. Get them out of you. By repentance, by the ministry of the blood of the Lamb, then you can go ahead. Remember, the Lord doesn't want us to be like the seven sons of Sceva who went about to conduct deliverance and the demon leaped upon them and the demons tore them apart. Brothers and sisters, that's what the exclusion clause is all about. And today we're going to be looking at a few other, you know, that the Lord wants to use to make our knowledge complete. So, uh, cost 130, prayer, fasting, and spiritual warfare. Today is lesson 25, the exclusion clause is part two. Let us pray. Father in heaven, have your way by your spirit. And Lord, reveal your word, unveil your word that we may have understanding and grasp what it takes to war successfully. You say you teach our fingers to war, and that's what we are doing. Help us as we now go down the wire this week to round up this course, to, to today receive the measure of what you want to give to us. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen and amen. So brothers and sisters, Songs of Solomon 2.15 says, Take us the foxes. The little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Second Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Yeshua, Hamashiach, is in you, except you be reprobate. He says, Examine yourself. Spiritual warfare is not for children. Spiritual warfare is not for presumptuous engagement. It is important that he who will go to war, she who will go to war, take time to check out how is your armor. And then beyond your armor, how are the things about you? Because if the armor is not intact, if there are chinks in the armor, then one can become a victim rather than a victor. And that's not what the lost plan for us is. The Lord doesn't plan for us to be victims, but rather victors in the arena of spiritual warfare. So let's look at Exclusions Clause number 17. We looked at 16 up to 16 last time. What are some of the little foxes we need to be aware of? If they are in you, deal with them before you proceed. These include the seed of worry, anxiety, and unbelief. Many times Christians are not sincere to themselves. There's so much inside. Mind you, the Lord sees those things. And to the extent that they represent being outside the will of the Father, Satan also can see. Fellow human beings can see when you are anxious, when you are worried, when you don't believe. Fellow human beings can see it. How much more? The powers of darkness. These things are little foxes. If you don't take them out, if you function in anxiety, you cannot war. If you function in worry, you cannot war. You function in unbelief, you cannot war. Each of them hinders prayer. And each of them has capacity to nullify decrees you issue in the arena of spiritual warfare. When any of them is present, words and decrees uttered become of non-effect. They are like hot air. They're just being issued. So you see worry, you see anxiety, you see unbelief, take them out. We are told that Yeshua couldn't do some miracles in Nazareth because of their unbelief. Unbelief will nullify faith any day, any time. It's the opposite of faith. Now let's go on to uh, other exclusion clauses that we need to look at. Number 18, lack of consecration. 
A lot of people want to go to war, they want to wage war, they want to uh, pass decrees, but they are not consecrated to the Lord. They are not. Mm -mm. They are not. They still are themselves. They own themselves. They own their time. They own their resources. They own everything that they have. They are not consecrated. They have not learned the virtue of laying them down for the Lord. And then they want to go to war. How can you go to war on your own? If you are not consecrated, you are on your own. If you are not consecrated, let me say it again, you are on your own. Then you are going to fight war. It is the same that the Jeremiah 17 says, Cause be the man that trusted in man that maketh flesh his hope. And that is why the Lord invites us that before we can get into spiritual warfare, one of the things that is vital we do is called total consecration. Romans 12 verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Elohim, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto Elohim, which is your reasonable service. What is about consecration that makes the difference? When you are consecrated, you are joined to the Lord. You are one spirit with the Lord. You say, Lord, you own me by creation. You own me by redemption. You own me by your providential care. So I surrender all. I lay myself at the altar of sacrifice. When you do that, in reality, you and the Lord are now one in the sense that there is no daylight between you and him. You don't carry an agenda different from his agenda. When you are consecrated, the will of the Lord is your dwelling place. That's just what you want to see. So when you pray, you pray in his will. When you are worrying, you are worrying in his will. And therefore, it's not really you that are doing it. When you are consecrated, the spirit of Elohim is simply using your vessel, possessing your vessel, and using your vessels to do the warfare. So, praying, warring without being consecrated is a very dangerous thing. You are basically on your own. Let's go on to number 19. Number 19 is negative imaginations and mindset that is negative. Now, it's so important to understand that our mind is a critical resource in spiritual warfare. It is where we process all Spiritual intelligence the Lord provides. I'm probably I'm going to talk to you this week about, you know, um, actionable spiritual intelligence. I'm going to share with you one of the things the Lord shared with us, for, you know, for empowerment of brethren, actionable spiritual intelligence. Now, you need to know that the actionable spiritual intelligence from any of the sources that it comes from, when it comes to your heart, your mind, the way you process it is going to make a difference. Why? We are what we think. Proverbs 23, 7. For as he, as he tinkered in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he said to you, but his heart is not with thee. Now we are what we think. As a man tinkered in his heart, so is he. So if you have negative imaginations and mindsets, you are thinking negatively about yourself, thinking negatively about your circumstance, thinking negatively about situations around you, that negativity is going to be your biggest problem in spiritual warfare. It's going to block your ability to have faith. It's going to block your ability to be able to war because you have already condemned yourself. That's what happened to the 10 spies of the 12 that were sent to go and spy out the promised land. Numbers 13 tells us something interesting. Verse 31, But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. Mind you, how did they know? It was in their mind. They asked you to go and spy out a land. How did you come back to say, hey, we can't go up. They are stronger than us when you didn't fight with them. They were mere spies. Verse 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. This is interesting. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. This is terrible. We looked at them. What we saw was giants. Then we, in our own sight, we looked and said we are like grasshoppers. And so were we in their sight. That sentenced them. There's no way they could go. And is that not the case with many believers today? You go to size up things and what you think is negative, you think 
you know, your imagination runs riot. Brothers and sisters, the victory of David over Goliath was first in his mind. David saw Goliath as a conquered figure, as one who was down. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 from verse 43. The Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staffs? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come unto me, and I will give thy flesh unto the force of the air and to the beast of the field. Verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, I want you to listen to this. Young man David, a teenager, said to a general, said to a field marshal, said to a commander of the forces of the Philistines, one of the baddest nations on planet Earth. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come again, I come unto thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. Look at that. And the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled, this day, David was telling the man, the war, the battle has not been joined. David said to him, this day, the Lord will deliver thee into my hand, and I'll smite thee, and take thy head from thee, and I'll give the carcass to the, of the host of the Philistines, this done to the fowls of the air. Wow. To the wild beasts of the earth. And all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. Wow. David did psychological operations. What is called psych ops. Against, David, against Goliath. David spoke what he saw from his imagination. What the Lord planted there. The Lord had assured him of victory. So he spoke to the man. And you know what? This could have destabilized Goliath. And when he went, maybe he must have been going in a rage to David. To go and stamp him out. And David took those smooth stones. And took one and flung it. And it just right on the forehead. And that was it. Then he went. As surely as he has spoken, cut off his head. Brothers and sisters, victory is in the mind. What are you seeing? It will govern what you say. What are you seeing? It will govern how you walk. The Bible offers a, full, a solution, therefore, that when you check up your mind and you see their negative imaginations that exalt them against the knowledge of Elohim, because Elohim says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. When your mind begins to play tricks, begins to tell you it's not possible, it's not doable, you're going to be a victim, you're going to be the next victim, you're not going to da 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 What does the Bible say we should do? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through Elohim to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Elohim, and bringing it to captivity every thought to the obedience of Yeshua. Look at that. Three things. You see what? Pulling down on strongholds. The next one is say, casting down imaginations. The next one is talks about bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Yeshua. These are things we should be doing daily in your kitchen. Something tells you, oh, this food you are preparing today to burn. No, that thing that came into your mind is a fiery that of the wicked one. Pull it down. Cast it out. Don't take it lightly. War right there in your kitchen, a good warfare. That thing that tells you today will be a bad day in school. Uh, that teacher that was doing one kind of thing, you know, against you on Friday, today is up against you. No. Cast down that imagination. If you don't, it begins to congeal from being taught. Fiery darts, the enemy threw at you. Suggestions, the enemy threw at you. They begin to settle and form and congeal. Just like when lava from a volcano congeals. It's hard, it's strong. That's what you should do. The fiery darts, throw them down. Any thought that came into you, can I suggest to you, it's not from you. It's from the enemy, and he wants to wear you down. He knows that if he, if he pierces through your mind and wears, wears you down and makes you to confess negatively about your health, about your life, about your capacity, about your resources, once you 
buy into what he's showing you. You know what? You are toast. The mind. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So war a good warfare in your mind. Pull down, cast down, throw down. Don't let it settle. If it's settled, cast down the imagination. Brothers and sisters, that's why the Lord also tells us in Romans 12 verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. What is it saying here? That is why it's not just about casting down and throwing down. You need to do something to the mind. You come to this world with a particular mindset. If you are from Africa, Nigerians have their mindset. And within Nigeria, Yorubas, Igbos, Hausas, Efix, Ishekiri, you know, different people have their mindset. If you're from South Africa, there's a South Africa mindset. Then within South Africa, there is Zulu mindset. There is Xhosa mindset. There is a Shwane mindset. And the different tribes of South Africa. You are in East Africa, there are mindsets, different language groups and cultures. Listen, in America, there's mindset of African Americans. There's mindset of European Americans. There's mindset of Latinos. It's it's natural. We come into this world with mindsets. Then the Lord's plan is that as we are born again, we now submit our mind to the work of his word so that the world begins to renew our minds, purge our minds of the cultural mindset so that it takes away my cultural mindset, takes away your cultural mindset, and we now have the mind of Yeshua. The kingdom mindset that is how we can agree on certain things. Otherwise, people can read the scripture and everybody can read with his own mindset. Male mindset, female mindset, children mindset, adult mindset. But when the world does the work in us, our mind is renewed. We have the mind of Yeshua. And when you have the mind of Yeshua, then you can do battle. Your mind is renewed. Then you can war spiritually and you win. And I pray today that we will come and you cannot visit the world and get the mind renewed. No, you have to dwell in the world and you have to allow the world to challenge you. Challenge, you know, most of the things, in fact, most of the things that Christians get into trouble with is based on false assessment of situation. They assess things from a mindset. They assess things to a mindset. So when it doesn't happen the way they want, they get frustrated, they get angry, they get offended, they curse, they do all manner of things, and in the process, they even compound the original problem. They now compound it by adding salt to pepper to justify themselves, and the Lord say, no way. At the end of the day, the kingdom mindset is one that obeys the Lord instinctively. No two ways about it. And that's where the Lord wants to get us to. Because when you are here, when you are there, you'll be able to handle actionable spiritual intelligence in real time. You can assess the throne of grace in real time. You can know the mind of the Father in real time. There's no hit and miss because the mind, when it's renewed, you can filter everything through the mind of Christ, the mind of Yeshua Hamashiach. And that's where the Lord wants us to be. If you are there, you can wage warfare successfully anytime because there's no personal agenda. There's nothing you are defending. There's nothing you are protecting. You are simply in the place of authority in the Lord and that authority in the Lord enables you to pray his mind, pray his will, and so it is. So brothers and sisters, when I go to number 20, exclusion clause number 20, he says in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 10, and having in the readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now he tells us something interesting. You cannot go to battle against ancient demons that have lived for thousands of years. Some of the demons were assigned to you to case you the day you were born. The day you were born, as mom was in labor, you know, just as the guardian angels were released to now accompany you on the journey of life, so Satan also assigned demons against your destiny. 
trying to trip you over, trying to observe you, trying to observe your background you came in from. Now, they know and they report back to those, those that are their bosses, the principals, the powers, the rulers of darkness of this age, spiritual wickedness in high places. They report back to them and they in turn can report back to Satan when they are targeting somebody. So one of the things the Lord wants us to know is that everyone, the Bible says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. Now, if there is a legitimate spiritual authority over your life, be careful how you deal with the issue of instructions given or directions given. If you have a legitimate authority, it could be a parent, it could be your husband, it could be anyone in authority over you or the pastor of your church. It could be younger than you, but it's the pastor, the younger than you, but it's overseer of the ministry. That person that is a legitimate spiritual authority, when he or she receives from the Lord the direction of what to happen, if you are not in obedience, if you are trying to negotiate with yourself how to make the word of instruction of non-effect and begin to modify it or kick against it or grumble against it or raise an insurrection against it in what is called conspiracy, the powers of darkness see and know. So you cannot go to fight them when your obedience is not fulfilled. It's not possible. It's a chink in your armor, a major one for that matter. Because Satan's kingdom is so organized, is so united, is so articulated, is so aligned that when they see in the kingdom of light, the kingdom of Yeshua, they don't see alignment, they don't see unity, they don't see order, they don't see obedience because they obey promptly. You know what? They know that this one is toast. So please, that's number 20. Number 21 is... Uh, uh, exclusion clause is fear. Fear is a negative emotion which freezes the capacity of a saint to engage the enemy and his agents. We told you the other time that fear has been defined by some as false evidence appearing real. The false evidence that is made to appear real that says you can't do it, that says it won't work for you, that says, oh, if you go that journey, you'll not come back, and all kinds of things. False evidence appearing real, in other words. Satan uses the spirit of fear. He's a spirit. It has torment. It torments. It congeals. It makes you lose your capacity. It looks, makes you lose your zest. Fear makes you, fear constricts you in the inside. Satan uses fear to intimidate. He uses fear to overwhelm and he uses fear to take away the capacity of a Christian to challenge or fight him and his kingdom. Brothers and sisters, the Lord tells us very clearly, fear, fear has torment and the assurances not to fear. In the Bible, there are so many assurances not to fear. Fear not, for I'm with you. Fear not, all over the Bible. And so you go to the Bible and check out how many instances, just type in your Google or in your Bible gateway or any search engine, fear not. Check how many times, how many circumstances, and the Lord is saying to you, fear not. I am with you. Fear not. If you pass through the waters, don't be afraid. I'm going to see you through. You're passing through the fire, don't be afraid. I'm going to see you through. I've already figured out all things. And if you will submit to what the Lord is saying in the now, then obviously the Lord will give you victory. Fear not, brother. Fear not, sister. Fear not, young man. Fear not, old person. Fear not, for the Lord himself is with you. Exclusion clause number 22, disunity and lack of alignment with legitimate authority. This is an expansion of what we said before. John 17, 20 to 23, Yeshua prayed that we may be one as he and the Father are one. And that is very important. Unity is basic in the gospel. If you're in a family, be in unity with your parents and the siblings. If you're in a local assembly, be in unity with the pastor, the leadership, and the brethren. Wherever the Lord plants you, if it's a network like International Missus Fellowship, be in unity and also be in alignment. Unity with all your heart, with all your mind, an alignment where you fit in. You find your space and fit in. You're part of the, you know, what we're doing in the authentic kingdom culture, the movement of the kingdom educational system, global school of ministry, master class, 
or you know the yes course, uh, the the train on YouTube and Facebook, any of these things. If you are truly receiving the revelation, then be in unity, be in alignment, so that we can speak the same thing, we can evaluate the same thing, we can pull in the same direction, we can push in the same direction, and this is one thing Satan fights, especially if there is pride inside of you and you don't know it, pride will make you want to always have your opinion separate from that. And I'm not talking about, no, in your normal life, you everybody has your opinion, but when it comes to issues of direction of the Lord, follow the leader. The direction of the Lord concerning what will happen, whether it is okay like this season, the Lord say, hey, you know what? Come apart. Be in prayer. Be in prayer. You know what? In a few days' time, by Thursday, is over. One month is over. But the enemy can fight your flesh. Oh, no, 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 not me. Uh, the other time we fasted, da, 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 da. No. Alignment makes you to be able, you don't pray long prayer. You don't pray winded prayer. And the, well, let me give you an illustration of what alignment can do. I said it the other day. When it comes to spiritual warfare, be careful that you don't pray confusion into yourself. It is wrong for somebody to say, oh, let us pray now. We're going to pray for this. Before he finishes what he's saying, people are already praying. Emotion flying left, right, and center. It mentions demon. Some people are binding the demon. Some are losing the demon. Some are casting the demon to the Arabian desert. Some are casting to the Na river Nile. Some are casting to the Mediterranean. Some to river Niger. And that is all you see. All kinds of confusion. The demons, when they are cast this way, they go that way. Cast that way, they go that way. Cast this way, they go this way. Cast back where they go that way. Because the church is not praying in one accord, the end is the demon stays where he is, and you know what? The people of Elohim suffer unnecessarily. As I said to you before, when it's time to pray warfare prayer, two approaches are recommended. One, it is either the leader of service, no matter how young he is, if we pray, say, listen, I want you all, we sense there is a demon of poverty that has ravaged, trying to ravage this church. We are going to stand in a place of authority in Yeshua Jesus and resist it and bind it and cast it to the Sahara Desert. If that's what that leader said, then don't pray a, anything left or right. Pray that prayer. Take your place in Yeshua. Challenge that demon and bind the demon cast into the Sahara Desert, not the Atlantic Ocean. Not the Bermuda Triangle, not the North Sea, not the Pacific Ocean. That place the leader said. And if it's, there's a, a real problem about doing that, then let the leader pray and let everybody say amen, which is even simpler and better. But you know that there are many places people think that warfare is what you exert in yourself. So people want to pray what they call Jim, Jim, Jim prayer. Uh, you know, Putin, his glory goes with us. They want to do Jim, Jim, Jim prayer. No. Warfare prayer is not Jim, Jim, Jim. Warfare prayer is spiritual. It's targeted. So let that leader pray. Everyone say amen. Because First Corinthians 1 says, I beseech you, brethren, that you all speak the same thing. You all mind the same thing. You all be of the same mind, of the same judgment. When we are that way, we are truly in alignment. Exclusion clause number 23, inability to let go. Inability to let go, and that leads some people to take sins to court. First Corinthians six warns against this. First Corinthians six one to uh, verse six, it says, "The brother goeth to law in verse six, great to law with a brother, brother, and before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong?" Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? You see, today you see believers go to court with believers easily. Debt owed. Money not paid. Oh, contract violated. One thing or the other. They go. They say, well, it's business. It's business. This is not church now. Uh-uh. If you are in the faith and another person in the faith, you are precluded from taking them to court. For you and you, two believers, 
sit before an unbelieving magistrate or judge to rubbish you all and speak from the exalted seat and abuse you, abuse the gospel and all that. And all the unbelievers in court are laughing and are gaping and you know what? No. He said, you are dishonoring the Lord by taking a fellow believer to, to court. Don't go and say, well, he's not really a believer. If he confessed Yeshua at one time and you know that person, you are precluded. You don't go to law with a fellow believer. It's part of the ordinance of the kingdom. So if you do that, as people are doing today, you disqualify yourself for spiritual warfare. Your obedience is not fulfilled. And so we need to take note of that. Then exclusion clause 24, indulging in works of the flesh which grieve and quench Holy Spirit. Indulging in works of the flesh that grieve Holy Spirit or quench Him. Men and brethren, there are a number of them. A number of them. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's read some of them. Verse 9. Know ye not that your righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Take note of that. This is off the bat. The unrighteous shall not inherit. And if we shall not inherit as to go to into an eternity, that means today the unrighteous cannot exercise the authority of the king. These are two opposites. Then he said, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of self with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Ten things he mentioned here, and such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Yeshua and by the Spirit of Elohim. Those ten things, he mentioned them, then he came to emphasize one of them in verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Yeshua, Shall I then take the members of Yeshua, make them members of an harlot? Elohim forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, said he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So if it's so that we are one spirit with the Lord, he now says in verse 18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of Elohim, and you are not your own. For he, for you are bought with a price, therefore glorify Elohim in your body and in your spirit, which are the Lord's. So, the ten things he mentioned here, and then of course, you know, ended up by explaining more about the doctrine of you know, immorality, how it defiles thoroughly the temple. So it means that somebody who is in any of these ten, whatever it is, no matter the reason, that person is disqualified for waging spiritual warfare. Because sin within cannot partner with a holy Elohim to seek him, to stamp approval on the decrees you make. Then Galatians chapter 5 goes on to talk about other works of the flesh, which he also says excluded from the kingdom. Galatians 5.13 For brethren, you have been called on to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion for the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That is the end of the law. Verse 15 But if you bite and devour one another, Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, these are the contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Once you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, verse 19, are manifest, which are these. It comes again, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, 
that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Look at that again. Explicit. He said, listen, these things are going to exclude you from the kingdom. And if they exclude you from the kingdom, of course, it means you cannot exercise the authority of the name of Yeshua and the power of the blood when sin has dominion over your life. That is the principle. And we need to understand this is, and even some of the things mentioned there are things you need to check up. For instance, what is witchcraft? Trying to control for personal advantage, for your own advantage. What is uh, hatred? You know, having animosity in the heart. Hating somebody, wanting somebody to die, wanting someone to be injured so that you can say, yes, I told them. And then having that kind of heart attitude, wishing ill in people, in your heart against people, that's hatred. Then variance, what is variance? Trying to be different, trying to be different, trying to be off, 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 the, off the unity uh, 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 fellowship. Unity of the congregation varies. You want to be a separate. And what is emulation? One, you see somebody wear that dress, you want it. Wear that shoe, you want it. That's emulation. Then look at the other one. Striving. Striving is always against somebody in authority over your life. It can't be authority against you. No, it's you against authority. That's the concept. Somebody has authority, the Lord gave, and the same where the Lord is leading, you say no. And you want the person to do what you want, then that is strife. Then what of her, what of uh, uh, um, uh, this one, um, rot, anger on steroids, anger on steroids, and then all these seditions, having to be, you know, try to stir up against authority. All these things they take care of. Now somebody may say, well, I, you know, I mean, I'm okay. I've done do this stuff. Listen, all these things are in the heart. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. You have heard it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's what they say. But I, Yeshua, the Prince of Life, say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, had committed adultery with her already in his heart. Look at that. So he now brings in the fact of lusting in the heart. Desire, a secret desire, evil desire, desire for something that the Lord does not agree, does not permit. You see, in the heart, that's where sin is committed. So the state of the heart matters to the Lord. And so we are told in Ephesians chapter 4, 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of Elohim, whereby we are sealed unto the door of redemption. All these things we mentioned today, any of them inside will grieve Holy Spirit. And there are many Christians who unknowingly have turned aside into vain jangling. Holy Spirit has been pushed out without animosity, without hatred, without all a spirit of vengeance, without vengefulness, without seditiousness, with all the things, without immoral you know, thoughts and immoral imaginations, they have pushed Holy Spirit out. It's now like in the church at Laodicea, the Yeshua was, used to be in the center of their heart. They were sensitive to Yeshua. Little thing, they can pick it up. But you know what? Yeshua has been pushed out. He's now at the outside, knocking to be let in. And one cannot see the state of oneself. And yet every single day we are going towards eternity. Every single day we are getting towards the day the trumpet will sound. Do you know that the worst thing that can happen to a Christian is to come to a place where you are striving against Elohim's purpose. Elohim doesn't need to consult you to tell a leader where he wants to go. And that's interesting. That's what we call election. Whatever you're doing in life, be careful how you fight against election. Because election does not look at somebody's qualification. The Lord picks somebody for something. And if the Lord picks somebody for something, be careful how you rise against. Either in your heart or with your tongue or you insinuate, set fire around or to do things. He said, no. First, First Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the spirit. Don't quench the spirit. Don't grieve the spirit. Don't quench him. Because you can grieve him to leave. You can quench him to stop his move. 
And that is why, especially also for those who like to methodize everything, yeah, it is good to have some order, but be careful how you methodize to the point where Holy Spirit can be quenched. He can no longer give direction. Also, we want everything methodized. It's natural. But brothers and sisters, let's be careful not to quench the Spirit. God moves in mysterious ways. He doesn't have to consult us. That's why the greatest thing that can happen to a believer is to come to a place of tenderness of heart. A place where your heart is tender. Where you can pick the signals of God. You don't just pray. You hear what he's saying in the now. And when you hear it, you are quick to obey. You don't go to analyze God's word. You see, today, the teaching in Bible college is how to analyze what he's saying. It is that analysis that made them to push off the instructions of the Lord. And today, people are using logic. Logic is the greatest enemy of the believer. You can logicalize things and quench him. So, men and brethren, it's so important that we know that the Lord is teaching our fingers to war. And we're going to stop the exclusion clauses today and go into other things down the wire, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, two editions, and that is it. Brothers and sisters, for this course, the Lord didn't make a mistake to expand our knowledge of the issues of prayer, fasting, spiritual warfare, and bring us to the place where he wants even the youngest amongst us to be a power bomb, even the youngest, because when you understand prayer, fasting, and spiritual warfare, you'll be not scared. You won't be scared at all. You know that you can influence what goes on in the natural from the spiritual realm. That includes houses of parliament, Congress, includes, you know, seat of authority, where the executive leaders of the country are. It includes those who are military generals. You can, in the realm of the spirit, other things and that is how we pray the prayers we pray for nations and persons of extreme strategic interest. Every day, there are people in the world today. They are the most outstanding people in the world today. We pray for them daily. The intercessors pray for them daily because by so doing, we are putting their hearts in the hand of Elohim to turn it with us for it once. By way of assignment today, one, briefly, briefly summarize each of the exclusion clauses discussed in this lesson. Number two, what personal message did you receive from this lesson? What personal message for practical application did you receive? I want to encourage you, take these things seriously. The Lord releasing them. This is not a function of research. This is not a function of a, a brilliant mind going to research, study this, study that, and follow that trail. No, this is download the Father gives since the year 2006, that's how he's been developing the courses of Global School of Ministry. He brings down load and we simply download it from as he's given it in real time. And then we check the scriptural passages as he gives to them and they are plotted in and that's it. So the Lord has given us this course to equip us because the end time will be a place of extreme battle. Go and read Revelation 12 from verse 10 to 12. You know that the earth rim will be a theater of never-ending battle. Right now, the pandemic we are facing is part of it. Four point something million people gone. Four point something million people and then hundreds of thousands infected. It's all satanic warfare. Everything that steals, kills, destroys, the enemy is back of it all. And so the Lord wants to train his people so that we can be able to hold what the Lord has given to us and not lose it. We can be able to, you know, fulfill the destiny the Lord has committed to our trust so that when he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, Yeshua has come that we may have life and have it more abundantly. So the training is to equip us to that end. And I want to encourage you, would you please share this video Right now, before we drop, can you share it to two, three, or four, or five people? Can you share it to some groups? Share it. Let people know. And please don't miss any of don't miss any of the coming lessons from tomorrow to Thursday. They are truly liberating. You need to know about actionable spiritual intelligence. 
You need to know about the, the watches in prayer and their significance, the hours of greatest significance in prayer. You need to know about the move of, of the mystery of iniquity and how the Lord has ordained us to counter them. That is what is going to come in these lessons. And then on Wednesday, I invite you, join us on Zoom to pray for South uh, for Israel. It's the day of Simcha Torah, which happens on Tuesday and Wednesday. So on Wednesday evening, eight o'clock London time, which is about this time, a few you know five minutes about this time, we will be on Zoom and we're going to pray for Israel. Just a number of things core among them is that the Torah that Israel reads every year, the Jews read every Sabbath. They cover the Torah. They start on the Simcha Torah to end. And they start the next circle and they just read it. They don't see. They don't hear. The scripture is just, you know, just there. The letter kills. We're going to pray that Holy Spirit will breathe the breath of life upon the Torah. Now this year, 5782, the greatest amount of Jews will embrace the Messiah Yeshua Hamashiach because the Torah Life, there's enough light in the Torah pointing people to Yeshua. And then in the Tanakh, which is the old covenant, there's so much light pointing to Yeshua. And there are so many prophecies from Genesis 3, 15, all the way to the end, Malachi, that point to the Messiah. We're going to pray that it will come alive, that when Israel reads the Torah and the Tanakh, they will see the Messiah of Israel in them all. And they'll be quickening their spirit man unto salvation. So we're going to pray on Wednesday, two hours. Join us, join the remnant to do that prayer. And the Lord bless you. I pray now and I make an announcement. Father in heaven, there's no one besides you. You are awesome in our midst. Lord, these revelations, let them not stand against us on that day, but Lord, let it be part of what you used to equip us to be overcomers and to run our race successfully in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. I just want to say this to you as you share the video. Please remember this resource is available for you free of charge. His glory goes with us. This memoir of Pastor Grace, Encounter with the Lord, what he did, the transformation, the consecration, and the things he pleased the Lord to do with her and through her, you know, on missions, on, you know, danger, in perils, on the road, in the house, the, the homelessness, everything she suffered for the sake of the Lord. How everything was taken out of her, and yet the Lord saw her through, so that he will prepare her for what he will use her to do. His glory goes with us. You can download your copy, free copy, at www.assuringgrace.org. Download your copy today, right now. And if you need a physical copy, for those who like physical copies, it can be sent to you, but by the grace of the Lord, contribute to ensure it sends to people. That's the wisdom the Lord gave to her. Send it to people free, but then when you receive your own, you also have to send it to five people or ten people by contributing to printing more. She's not taking a dime. There's nothing we've done that is as successful as this in terms of expansion. It's been translated to Manda, a Chinese language. Hindi is ongoing. Swahili, French, Portuguese, Espanol, you know, um, uh, um, uh, different groups. You know, yeah, Portuguese has been printed in Angola, printed in uh, South Africa, printed in Tanzania, printed in Zimbabwe, printed in Kenya, printed in Ghana, printed in the UK, printed in the USA, printed in, you know, Ireland, got a copy from here. This is all going on, all of them, this year, 2021. And this is somebody who was almost gone. And the Lord say, I raise you up. You have unfinished business. That's why we take it seriously. It's your part of your unfinished business. So get along, Bill Grace. Come alongside Pastor Grace. Let's make it happen. Let brethren in persecuted church across the world read this and be encouraged. Like today, we are praying for the persecuted church. You know, those 50 top nations in the world that where your being a Christian is like a death sentence. It's like a sentence of being stripped of your citizenship or any privilege. This 
I believe this book will help them. We can all contribute to make it happen by the grace of the Lord. We bless the Lord for you all. I will say, may the Father bless you and do you good. So it is, and so it shall be to you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you so much, Elect, for being with us. The Lord bless you. Bye-bye.